I started off as a bird hunter because that's what my dad and his dad did. I've always liked hunting over dogs for birds. Keeps you active, um, you're never bored. I've been getting um, about two deer per year for the last decade or so, and, and that's been a really nice lifestyle change for my wife and I because at this point we're pretty much off the grid when it comes to meat. So we make all of our own sausage and cured meats. People can perceive hunting as maybe negative, but with a little bit of investigation and study, we find that it's actually really critical to maintain certain landscapes. I was really interested in fish and wildlife when I was a kid, and I ended up uh, pursuing that as a career. Went to university to study fisheries management in particular. And often in the San Francisco Bay Area, we see all these great big, fine new wetland restoration projects going throughout the Bay and all over California. Even though there's some big foundation money or particular grants associated with the money, it's always, almost always matched by Pittman-Robertson Act, which is a direct contribution from hunters and outdoor, you know, uh, shooters themselves. It's an incredibly important way to fund wildlife conservation, land conservation in general. So as a hunter, yeah, I know that every piece of gear that I'm purchasing is getting to some extent funneled back into the activity that I, that I enjoy. And I've been a hunter pretty much most of my life. It's one of the few places I can still go where my cell phone won't work and I can, I can relax a little bit. Hunting has so many net positive benefits in this state and that's a good feeling. We use ballistics gel to demonstrate some of the differences between lead and non-lead ammunition. When a lead bullet hits an animal, it breaks apart, leaving sometimes hundreds of pieces in remains that are left in the field. The ballistic gel freezes the moment of impact. It allows us to look at how a bullet reacts when it hits an animal, and we're able to capture and see the impact of the bullet. After we've captured the bullet in the gel, we can radiograph those gels, and that gives us the true picture of the extent of the fragmentation. And looking at the x-ray of the path of the lead bullet, we can see how much the lead bullet fragments. All the white spots in this radiograph are lead fragments. When we weigh lead ammunition, we find that it can lose up to 40% of its original weight. Wildlife species such as bald eagles, golden eagles, and California condors inadvertently ingest lead fragments as they're feeding on remains left in the field. Repeated exposures over time lead to detrimental health effects and even to death. The number one factor limiting the recovery of the critically endangered California condor is the inadvertent ingestion of lead fragments on the landscape. You know, one of the things that hunters can definitely do is, is by simply using a different tool, they can eliminate an entire source of lead that will then uh, dramatically reduce exposures in, in, in wildlife and in, especially in the California condor. We shoot a non-lead and a lead bullet into the ballistics gel to demonstrate some of the differences between lead and non-lead ammunition. As we look at the gel that was shot with non-lead ammunition, we can see a rapid rate of expansion, a great initial wound channel, deep penetration, and no fragmentation in the gel. After we've captured the bullet in the gel, we can radiograph those gels, and that gives us the true picture of the extent of fragmentation. In the radiograph of the non-lead gel, we don't see any white spots that would indicate fragmentation. But by comparison, if looking at the x-ray of the path of the lead bullet, you can see how much fragmentation there is. We can weigh the spent bullet, and in comparison to its original weight, we can determine how much has been lost due to fragmentation. When we weigh lead ammunition, we find that it can lose up to 40% of its original weight. But when we weigh the non-lead ammunition, it typically retains about 98% of its original weight. There's a lot of benefits to using non-lead ammunition. It's rapid rate of expansion, deep penetration, and the main difference is you don't have the extent of fragmentation with the non-lead as you do with the lead. And because of the high weight retention, you're not leaving fragments on the landscape. Invasive species are a difficult challenge for many land managers. 
they cause a huge amount of damage and can really ruin a system. So with our management of invasive pigs at our park, um, we knew we wanted to use uh, ground hunting as a tool, um, but lead bullets will fragment when they hit flesh and uh, any animal that got into a carcass uh, is, is potentially going to have lead poisoning. When we decided to use uh, non-lead ammunition, um, we hadn't used it before, but we did know, you know that if you have two bullets, non-lead and lead, that are the same grain weight, the non-lead bullet is going to be longer than the lead bullet. That longer bullet is going to react differently to your barrel, it's going to react differently to your rifling, which means you're going to have different ballistics. Reducing the grain weight on a non-lead bullet got us similar ballistics to a higher grain weight lead bullet. You want to make sure you sight in your rifle with the non-lead ammunition. Um, it is going to shoot slightly different because it's a different kind of metal. So we found that uh, the tipped bullets in the non-lead, um, that that tip really helps to drive the initial expansion. At our park managing invasive pigs, um, we've used all non-lead ammunition, um, shot hundreds of rounds, dropped hundreds of animals. Um, it's just as effective um, and we have the added benefit of knowing that uh, there's no lead being left on the landscape. For us, a uh, simple adjustment of reducing our grain weight, um, ensuring that your rifle's sighted in with the non-lead uh, ammunition, um, and using the polymer tips made the change to non-lead really easy. John's 17 now, so and I've been able to bring him into this over the last six, seven years now. It's a true family tradition. Um, I think it's great. I love spending time out in the woods, get some time away from like technology life and just go back to where life's more fun, I think. He teaches me a lot and has taught me a lot, figuring out new ways to stalk animals, get ways to get shots. He's, he's learned quite a bit in the last couple years to where he's a pretty good tracker now. Leave no trace is very important. Um, my father really believed in it. It was all about keeping nature as nature was meant to be kept, um, free of bottle tops and, and pieces of plastic here and there. And, and I've been you know, working with John on that. As the bobcats, condors, turkey vultures, as everybody goes and sees a, a carcass on the ground and as they start feeding on it, if it was shot with lead, there's been fragmentation. That fragmentation is in the meat. When those animals eat the meat with that lead fragmentation, it's not necessarily a good thing. So by using copper, copper fits into that no trace by ensuring that we don't leave that lead residue out for our wild friends to uh, ingest and maybe have problems down the line later. The copper bullet doesn't fragment like the um, lead does at all. I was always told that the copper didn't, didn't, didn't work, that it went right straight through. But I found that it does put the impact to the game. And as the copper went in and it mushroomed out, it never left any fragments. After shooting and having a lot of one-shot kills with it, it shows that it works and even for a little bit extra, it's a better bullet. So if you think about it, you're only shooting maybe a couple rounds a year, maybe five, six if you're lucky. That's really not that huge of a thing. So I think it's all around just a really good conservation. Yeah, I'd say I'm definitely a better spotter. And so far this year, shooter also. <laughs> yeah, he's won the big buck, big buck contest so far this year. <laughs> it's, a, it's a good thing to be able to take your son out and share with him what you've done for 35, 40 years. The hunters are the ones that pretty much donate most of the money that keeps these places going. Um, with the fees um, that are paid comes that restoration of properties of many species, not just species that we hunt. I am more than happy to be able to contribute to be able to hunt and fish on public land and take my family out and be able to camp and, and enjoy nature as the way it's meant to be enjoyed. You know, you want to be able to come back here years from now and, and when he has children, um, 
that he can bring them back and it'll be the same spot the same natural he can say how big that tree's gotten or how that creek has changed routes or something of that nature but for, it's important for it to still be in that natural state we've gone from lead ammunition to non-lead usually copper type uh, ammunition um, and if that's the little thing that I need to do to help keep us able to hunt and keep the species going and, and expanding and, and the number of condors growing, then so be it. As we know, if you don't take care of Mother Nature, Mother Nature's not going to take care of you.